We are live. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Tuesday here on St. Tomer Spirits. For everyone watching along with the live stream, hello. Good to see you. For everyone watching the replay, hey, how are you? Sorry you missed us live, but it's going to be a fun show. Please, 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 I implore you. Say hey in the comments. If you're here live, say hey in the chat. Everyone listening, when I get this actually uploaded as a podcast to, like, Stitcher or Spotify, Hello. Uh, I'm really excited today. It's going to be a fun one. We're talking about probably the best kept, worst kept secret of Scotch whiskey, of sherry cask whiskey, of whiskey that is stupid cheap, that I still don't understand how this 25-year-old Scotch is so cheap. <laughs> We're talking about Glenn Farkless today, guys. Um, joining me today will be George Grant of the Grant family who runs Glenn Farkless. He's kind of the global ambassador. And then also joining me today is my dear friend, Katie O'Donnell, who is the area sales rep for SoCal and Las Vegas with Bond and Royal and 375 Avenue Park Spirits. Hi, Katie. Hi, thanks for having me. My pleasure. You know I love Glenn Farkless, so I'm like, all right. Let's do Glenn Farkless. And I'm like, can we, do, can we get George? And you're like, maybe. <laughs> I can't make promises for him. <laughs> I do my best. I do you're my like, best. Maybe we'll George. get George, but you could definitely have me. And I'm like, I'm good with that either way. Perfect. Well, you'll have both of us. So it'll be the best of both worlds today. Absolutely. So I already took a wee little nip off of the 105 before we got started because it's been a little too long. I have, I actually, you know what? I remember the last time I had 105. It was National Margarita Day in like early 2020, I think, with you. You had just moved out of Burbank. <gasps> yep. Sounds, sounds about right. <laughs> sounds about right. We would drink scotch on National last... Margarita Day. <laughs> you, I was hanging out with you. We just visited a couple of tequila accounts, and then we go to Black Market in Studio City, and you're like, what do you want? I'm like... I don't know. You're like, they have 105. You want that? I'm like, can I have scotch on margarita day? You're like, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> you can have scotch any day you want. Our friend Joe Van Name is here. He says, yes, Glenn Farkless. Yay. I know. It's such a great, I'm such, I'm so blessed to be able to work with this amazing brand on the daily. Like, it's just, an, it's just incredible. I mean, to be fair, though, watching your stories, you would think it's tequila, tequila, tequila. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I should probably be more. Um, I should spread the love around my children a little bit more. But <laughs> all jokes aside, love- though, um, no, I know you love this brand. And you know, I love this brand. Uh, for those of you guys watching, uh, I will try and add it post screen. But if you go to my channel you will be able to see my cocktail video and my whiskey tasting video from December and November, respectively, with the Glenn Farkless 12-year, this bad boy right here. So, Katie, what order do we want to go in? I have it set up 105, 12, 21, 25, but we can swap it around. We can put 105 at the end. We can put 12 at the beginning. We can put 105 after 12. How do you want to do this? I like to put what do you think the best order is? Yeah, I like to put 105 at the end. Um, just because of the proof. So that one is going to be heftier on your palate for sure. Um, and then I say we just go up in age and and see, I know that's that's what I had available today for y'all. So we do also have a 10 year and a 17 year available <laughs> that are missing from the, from our lineup today. But um, the 17 year is phenomenal. Um, the 10 year is great for cocktail mixing as well. So you have a full variety of Glen Farkless available to you in Southern California. And there's some family casks still floating around too. Yes. I was about to say the family casks. I want to, I think we have some at the pint even. So when we reopen, you'll have to come visit and try some family cask. Sure. Yeah. You want a sample? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll never say no, but we'll wait for George to come back in town for that one. <laughs> yeah. We'll have him put the bill. Speaking for us. of George Grant. Oh, the man He's loading in still, it looks like. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> um, Wi-Fi wi- wi- in Scotland is always fun, too, you know? I mean, <laughs> let's adjust my glasses a little bit, my bottles here. Also, a big thank you to you, Katie, and to Glenn Farkless for providing the whiskey for us today to taste 
I was laughing my ass off last week when you texted me. You're like, so I'm going to, I'm dead. You're, let me actually read your text message. It's just so perfect. <laughs> um, and for those of you who haven't figured it out, Katie and I are really good friends and we have a really great relationship and a really great mutual respect for each other. And I really respect her a lot. She's a good lady. Thank you. She says, and I quote, you're going to die. All I have is 21, 25, and 105. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, that's not a problem. <laughs> right. We'll do high-end skews today. <laughs> so George said he's having some issues connecting. As I said, the the, the Scottish Wi-Fi sometimes it's is all a- good. Our friend he- Anand is also here. He's actually able to join us for once. Usually he's at work. Um, he said the 25 years is so good. And finally, after years of looking, I found a bottle of the 40. Last had it in a distillery five years ago. Nice. On him, that's super dope that you have the 40. Um, another bartender up in the SoCal region was supposed to give me a sample of 40, but he, he I don't even really know what happened, but like he was going to sell it and then he didn't sell it and he opened it, was going to give me a sample, but then he didn't give me a sample. Uh, so I'll have to try yours when I come down to your place in time. On him lives in the OC, by the way, Katie. So oh, next nice. time you're doing something in OC, he'll probably be there. Perfect, yeah. Our friend yeah, Joe says the 15 year is also very nice. Yeah, the 15 year we can't get in the States. So if you go to Mexico or you go to Canada or you go anywhere else and you can pick up a bottle, bring it home. <laughs> Why not- can't we get it here? Um, so back, not back in the day, but you know how we recently just started having 700 milliliters be a, a proof Yeah, by- 70 CLs. Yeah, so, um, but prior to that, when we only had 750s, we chose to put the 17 year rather than the 15 year in those 750s and share it with the United States. So it was it was really a bottling issue. Um, and everyone's been asking me if I think that's gonna change. I don't know, things take a long time to change in our world. So <laughs> yeah, very <laughs> not true. anticipating it anytime soon. Also, hey, from our friend Matt, the Whiskey Crusaders, he says, hey, Sam and Joe, talking to our friend Joe Van Name, of course. Also, hey. Joe says, Milroy's in Soho has the 15. Oh, sneaky people. <laughs> I mean, I've seen many accounts, even out here, bringing in bottles that they shouldn't have. And I'm like, you can't just buy a bottle from Costco and then sell it at the bar. You could try. <laughs> you shouldn't do it. No, they did know. it, but they aren't legally allowed to do it. This is very true. Oh, I love the 12 year. He said his computer doesn't like StreamYard, but he's going to try again. So we'll see if it works this time. So well, yeah, the twelve year, at the very least, there's more yeah, people I'm here. talking about whiskey with. I'm here. Um, yeah, the twelve year is really great. So it's 100 percent Oloroso sherry cask aging on the on Glen Farkless, which is it's pretty unique. Um, we use first, second, third, and fourth fill, so you get a nice, beautiful, you know, kind of blend of the sherry it's not it is there it's very very present especially in the younger years but it's not super overwhelming um it's i think it's very delightful a very nice pairing with the whiskey Anand says that cast cartel atlanta has the 15 year for 198 wow and Joel reminded me that milroy's is in soho london not soho new york oh there we go um you know there's a reason i call this episode go finish yourself with glenn farkless because Glenn Farkless's sherry cask maturation. Mm-hmm. There's no finishing. This is very true. Which is a really interesting thing. You don't see, you know, full sherry cask matured scotch whiskey very often. Yeah, they definitely are um, creatures of habit and not, we're not changing the, the profile of Glenn Farkless any days, any, anytime soon, if ever. So yeah, it's just a beautiful, historic and consistent lineup. Love it. So talk to us about the Sherry Cash. Is it his first, third, and second fill? First, first, second, third, and fourth fill. Okay. Yeah. So it's a blend of, oh, my computer is very loud. It's a blend of all of those, um, those different casts. I believe it's, it's 60, 40. I think it's 60 first and second, 40, third, and fourth. Um, so basically once we empty out the Sherry, the sherry cask or the sherry butts or whatever size it is, then it gets refilled with whiskey and refilled with whiskey and refilled with whiskey. And then they're all blended together to have that final product. So you do get that 
some that are first fill sherry, they're going to be super overwhelmingly. Sherry. <gasps> There's George. George. Ooh, sorry about that. Oh, you're great, George. Don't worry about it. Uh, Joe, that's a great question, and one that actually our new guest can answer. <laughs> George, how old are the fourth fill barrels going into the Glen Barclays 12 year? Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> right off the bat, George, welcome to the game. Um, <laughs> some of them are going to be yeah, 30, 40 years old, and some of them are going to be 100 years old. Wow. And sort of anything, right. anything in between. So there you go, Joe. From 30 to 40 to 100 years. That's a very wide range. Um, well, George, you know, trial by fire. I threw you right into the fire. Welcome, welcome. Good to see you again. I haven't seen you since your trip over here in February of 2020 with Katie at the pint when you and Phil were just drinking whiskey. <laughs> Well, that's what we're supposed to do, isn't it? I mean, it, <laughs> I, I keep telling everybody about that trip because I mean, everyone says, you know, how has the whole COVID thing sort of affected you? And um, I, I try and tell people how hard done by I was. You know, I, I did make it to the States. I made it to Germany. I made it to Australia. I made it to New Zealand um, but before March kicked in. <laughs> we miss you. We can't wait to have you come back. Yes, please. Come back over. Do more fun things here and bring some, like, fun distillery stuff only over here, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> if we had any of that, I certainly would. I mean, it's, it's been nuts. We've been shot for a, over a year. Uh, we're hoping to reopen the visitor center 5th of July. So, oh, wow. wow, you guys still aren't open. But, I mean, the distillery's running making whiskey, so that's the most important thing. So. Indeed. Indeed, that is the most important thing. I agree. So, I have another question. Are the sherry barrels being used actual sherry casks or are they yes. you know sherry quote unquote finishing casks where you know sherry's put in them just long enough to get the flavor into the wood and then dumped and then whiskey's put in there no i, mean, I know exactly what, what you're meaning uh, no we, we insist that the casks that we have have held sherry for at least uh, four or five years um the older ones that we have obviously held sherry for a considerably longer period of time um but exactly as you said, you know, there is companies out there now that literally have seasoned the casks for a couple of months. It's unfortunate, you know. It's something that I always ask brands is like, are you doing sherry seasoning casks, sherry finishing casks, or are you doing like actual real sherry casks from a bodega? Um, do you work with one bodega in particular, or is this whoever's available? No, we, we've been working with the same bodega since 1988, um, Jose Miguel Martin. Um, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's not that long ago, but everything I guess that we're selling at the moment, especially in the standard range, um, all those casks have come uh, from them. And, and it was, like, prior to that, it was, as you said, it was just a, a crapshoot. You know, it was, um, you, it was sort of hit or miss. You were able to get maybe a dozen casks here, six casks there, um, and you weren't always 100% sure on the, the quality or, or where they've actually come from. But at least this yeah. week, we are now sure. Well, George, while we were waiting for you, we started tapping into the 12 year if you want to join us in a drink. <laughs> I don't have a 12 year old, but I'll drink something else. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, George. Good to see you. Welcome to the channel. Sad. And just for the record, not everyone gets that trial by fire. Welcome. <laughs> But it's, uh, it's a strange one because we don't obviously have the 12 year old for sale here in the UK. Uh, it's it's more of, it's an export only whiskey, really. Uh, so, so it's um, especially with the, the visitor center having been closed, um, I, I kind of like struggle to even find stock. So, <laughs> um, yeah, we were talking briefly about a lot of people had commented that they are really into the 15 year, and I told them to, to go seeking on their vacations and bring it back to us. Exactly. It was, it was the same as I do when I come to the States. I, I go looking for the 17-year-old. Um, yeah. The 17, oh, it's a beauty. So we have a truncated lineup for Sam today because I uh, had my parents in town and I had what I had and, and I didn't have time to go get more because they were they were here. I had to spend time with them. So we're doing the 12, the 21, the 25, and the 105. Perfect. I've got the yeah. rest of them. And you know, on the topic of releases and things that we can't always get access to, Anand asked what prompted the release of the Family Cask series 
and wanted to start also by ending and saying he loves them. Um, they first started in 2007. Um, and of course, we, we kind of thought about doing it for a while. Um, and the original plan was we were going to release 10 uh, vintages of the family casks. And then every year, so then after five years, we would have 50 family casks. But then another whiskey company who obviously cannot name uh, re released something and said that they had the biggest range of, um, of, of whiskey available. And we went, well, no, you don't. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, they had, they had some older stuff, but they had massive gaps in their inventory as well. So we um, decided, right, bugger it, we'll launch all our family casks at exactly the same time uh, just to <laughs> piss them off, basically. <laughs> Um, but but I mean it, it was a strange thing to sort of do. Um, I mean I, when we first did it, I mean I must have I didn't really think it was going to take off. I mean I mean who would have thought that people wanted to buy a vintage you know, whiskey? Um, but but it was it was true. People wanted to buy the year they were born, the year they got married, the year they got divorced. You know everyone's got really important years to them. <laughs> um, yeah. And it, and it has. I'm like just. I mean, something that's been absolutely amazing, and it's just grown arms and legs. I mean, we've done over 300 different casks for the family cast now. I don't know if you can see my face right now, George, but it's just like, what? <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure if you're being cheeky, that vintage whiskey you didn't think was going to be a selling point. I mean, uh, but You have to remember back to like 2007. Um, the whole single cask mentality, the, 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 especially in having individual years from each one, um, it, it was, I guess, you know, a, a shot into the unknown. I mean, yes, it's something that it's become very available 2007. now. Fair enough that I don't know about 2007 because I was 15. <laughs> I was like, you couldn't even drink then, so you wouldn't know. <laughs> no, I couldn't have. I couldn't drink until 2013. <laughs> The, the, the biggest thing that I'm upset about is when they were first launched, you could buy the full set, which was 1952 to 1994, uh, 43 different casks. You could buy them all retail for £14,000. If you want the full set today retail, it's quarter of a million pounds, 250000 Holy hell! And, and, and I just want that 1992 cask. Okay, that's all I care about is find me a 1992 cask. Well, there's, lo there's, there's lots of them. There. That's an easy one. Yeah, well, that's my birth year, so that's what I want. <laughs> oh. That's awesome. Wow. That's but insane. It's, it's just it's been incredible, absolutely insane. I mean, and uh, some of them we have started to run out of. So, so the older ones that we have, um, so everything from 52 and 53 ran out fairly early on. Um, we will not be rebottling any of the family casks pre-77. So, so once the oh, wow. of those ones uh, run out, then that will be it. But but in mean, seventy seven up until what are we at two thousand five two thousand six at the moment you know there's still a fair fair decent run available. Wow. Just the fact that you have liquid that old kind of just. I mean, considering it's Glen Farkless, and I know Glen Farkless has you know stocks upon stocks because you really you have your single cask, your family casks, and you have your core range, and you know. I don't know what I'm saying. I just, I guess I'm not so surprised from Glenn Farkless. Um, so we were talking before you joined us, George, about the reason I called today's episode, go finish yourself. Because of the fact that Glenn Farkless does no cask finishing. It's all sherry cask maturation. There's no sherry cask finishing. And Katie was saying it's Oloroso casks, which leads me to my next question of, have there been any experiments of other cask maturation types? So, so this is one of the questions that has definitely come up an awful lot since doing all these online presentations. Uh, and it's people so you have asked, you know, have you experimented with this? Have you tried this? Have you tried that? And what you have to remember is we are 185 years old this year. Um, yes, we, we tried all this stuff 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 70 years ago. Um, we, we, we've done all these different things before, realized it doesn't work, and that's why we're using all the Rosso casks. But it, but it was, it was back in the mid sort of 50s, early 60s, I think, uh, that my grandfather actually took six different types of sherry casks. So Oloroso, Pedro Jimenez, Fido, Manzanillo, Amitanado, and another. Um, so, so he took uh, 15 casks of each, filled them, and then obviously then checked them over a period of time. Uh, dosing them, trying them, 
And then it was then after that that we, he realized, that, and obviously at this point my father had also joined, that Oloroso was definitely the best for Glen Farkles. So what you're telling me is that there will be no mezcal matured Glen Farkles coming to the market? No Los Vecinos <laughs> matured? <laughs> there's, there's nothing planned at the moment. I mean, we, we still have some port casks in the warehouse. We've got some cognac casks. Uh, we've got different, you know, obviously different sizes. We've got um, uh, port pipes as well, you know, so, so, which we will still use as uh, as a special, um, like a single cask project, but it's not something that's- I was going to say, yeah, is there plans to release those individual bottlings or anything of that nature? So the, the last port pipe we did in the US was actually split between the Dundee Dell and Park Avenue, I think. They, they, they took half the port pipe each. Joe asked a really good question. He said, what happened to the experimental casks? <laughs> we As in, he, he and I both want to know, are they still there? And if we come to visit you when COVID is over, can we drink from them? I mean, there's still a couple of PX casks in the warehouse. We've still got, um, I just did a Manzanilla cask for, for Japan. So there's, I'm sure there's a few of them lying around. Um, yeah. <laughs> That sounds totally cool, though. A Glen Fark was done in a Manzanilla cask. Manzanilla is not something you see done in sherry very often, for whiskey, anyways. Yeah, I mean, it, it, what we found with Glen Farkles is, you know, I think you see it when you taste the normal lineup as well. Glen Farkles is a very big, you know, almost like fruity whiskey, especially on the younger ones. Um, so when it does go into these sort of lighter sherry casks, uh, they do sort of, um, they, I must admit, they don't mature very uh, quickly. So, so it doesn't really work when it's like 10 or 12 years old. But once you do get sort of past 20, it, it really sort of comes into its own. Huh. That's very, mm. very interesting. Mm. Mm. Man, I mm. am enjoying that so much. So, so, how is it over with you guys? Are you guys still locked down or are you able to do whatever you want? Um, we can't do whatever we want, um, but we're getting closer to that. So we have um, a lot of bars have reopened, which have not been open since last March. So that happened this month. Very exciting. Um, we seem to be having a lot a good response to the vaccine. So there's a, there's a lot of opportunity that's coming in the next couple of weeks. I think that most everything will kind of return back to normal. We still obviously take precautions and and follow the, the guidelines that are given to us. But yeah, for the first time ever, it feels like LA has some life back into it. Yeah, you know, yeah. accounts are, bars and restaurants are reopening, like Katie was saying. You know, I was talking to Phil the other day and he's wanting to reopen next month. And, you know, as nervous as I am, I'm also really excited to go back to work because I'm bored of sitting on my ass every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had a rapid, re like a rapid reopening last week. And then some people are taking their time to get their staffing together. So yeah. I think, yeah, by this time next month, I think that anyone who, who made it through is going to be able to welcome guests back into their doors, which is really exciting. Cool. Yeah. That'll be very fun, definitely. Yeah. It'll be very, very nice. <laughs> Can't complain <laughs> about that. But it's nice. No, to definitely have not. We have all the outdoor seating now that's like extra, and it's so nice in California, you know, like we should just leave it yeah, there. Shut up. Just shut up. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm really hoping they keep that outdoor seating. Because you know it's been really nice and warm. It's been a little hot sometimes, okay, and it gets kind of. I'm speaking to you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> so we, had, we... we had snow again last week. I mean, it's just been. So, 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 so I mean, they, they opened up things last Monday, so you can actually sit outside. But it was two degrees and snowing. So, so yeah, <laughs> I'll pass. Yeah. Yeah. It does not sound very fun. I'll, I got to admit, with that, George. And, and obviously, the whole of Scotland is um, becoming very COVID safe, apart from where we live. Um, so, so Murray, which is one of whatever fifty regions, um, has got the highest COVID cases. So, so really? we're, we're up at we're up at ninety nine point one. Uh, so, so they're actually thinking about shutting um, the Murray down again to like a full lockdown. So it's just wow, wow. I know. George, stay safe. We need that pal of yours to stay intact. Well, we, just, we really have been. I mean, and that's what we did for, when it first kicked off. We did we, we knee-jerk reaction, shut the distillery for three weeks, shut the visitor center, obviously. Um, after three weeks, we started up production, and we, and we kept running all the way through. Um, but we were very strict about the, the plant, about letting people in. 
because we really wanted to ensure that all the staff members were safe. Um, because obviously if one of them did get it, we would of course then have to shut the place down. Yeah. So just let's back up and rewind just a little bit, George. Um, what exactly is it that you do on behalf of Glen Forkless? Obviously you're part of the family, the grand family that owns it, George Grant, you know, J.G. Grant owned Glen Forkless Distillery. But what is your actual role? You're kind of like the global ambassador, right? Yes, so my, my job title is sales director. Um, so, so in my normal life, I would travel maybe seven, seven and a half months a year, um, visiting various different markets, talking about Glen Farkless, promoting Glen Farkless, uh, speaking to distributors, um, speaking to new distributors. So it's um, but it, but it's, it's one of those things that's quite unusual. You know, but my job title does say sales in it. Um, I, I don't think I've actually sold a bottle for, for about twenty years. Um, <laughs> you, it, it, it's gone to the point now where, where it's almost you, you, it's on allocation. I mean, the whiskey, single malt whiskey has just boomed so much in, in the last um, you know, 10, 15 years, especially. Um, so it's just you know, growing arms and legs, and I, I guess it's go out, fly the flag, talk about Glen Farkless, speak to people, um, and and that's what we've also been doing during the whole COVID thing. I mean, this is my you this is my ninety seventh online um, presentation tasting thing, or whatever. Um, you know, we were very quick off the mark, um, especially like for, for obviously you can't do it in the states, but um, for for like a, the UK, US, Australia, New Zealand, uh, we did lots of these um, sort of mini little bottles for, for sending out for for tasting. Um, so, so we've been able to you know, keep talking about Glen Farkless, and that's been the, the key. Those are cool little bottles. <laughs> yeah, the, the, I spent hours making them myself. You know, one thing I like about Glen Farkless is the packaging, actually. It's very old school, kind of. You know, it doesn't look all modern like a lot of brands are going to, you know, more like a modern, more clean, minimalistic look. Yep. And Glen Farkless really just kind of, I feel like it's embracing the past and it's very old school. It's very much like, you know, just grab the 25, just the, you know, off yellow, like kind of egg white cream eggshell uh, label, you know, it's to the point, not a bunch of fancy frou frou stuff on the back. <laughs> I like it. You know, that's one thing really I like about Glen Farkless is, you know, how just kind of old school the bottles are and how the labels are. Although I will say my biggest gripe is for those of you watching on the live stream is the brown glass because it makes it a little hard to see. So, so there is a reason for the brown glass. Um, Please. In, in, in the rest of the world, they do actually have clear glass for one of five, but for, for the 15, 21, 25, 30, 40, it, it's all in brown glass. Why is it in brown glass? Because we don't add any, add any coloring or caramel to our whiskey. All our whiskey is natural color. So, so if, if you did go shopping and you, it, there was like an older bottle of 15 next to a new bottle, there would be a slight difference in the color because every time we rebottle it, the batches will change. You know, we're, we're not Dalmore, we're not Johnny Walker. We, we don't add ca uh, coloring to our whiskey to make sure it's the same every time. Fair oh. enough. And also, you know, as Matt said, brown glass or just colored glass in general, like Laforage green glass will protect the whiskey from the sunlight and, you know, from the sun fucking with it and kind of like oxidation a little bit. But it's, it's quite bizarre. I mean, historically, obviously, the clear glass was really, really difficult to get and really expensive. Um, but but now trying to get brown glass is bloody expensive because everyone just makes <laughs> clear glass. Um, but, 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 you know, one thing that we have stuck to, you know, you look at the range of Lymphorcles, look at the 10, 15, 17, 21, 25, 105, um, all the whiskey is in the same bottle. It's the same tube. You know, we're not trying to sell you the fancy packaging side of it. Uh, you know, you're paying for the liquid that's actually inside it. So, and that's what you know. We want you to be able to, you know, be able to not feel sad, or you know, really have to think of a special occasion where you're going to be able to open that bottle of whiskey. We want you to be able to open it, drink it, and then hopefully go get another one. So I remember when I used to work at a liquor store in West Hollywood. And they had the 25 and it was like 300 bucks a bottle. And I'm just looking at it and I'm like, how is this 25 year old scotch so inexpensive? And it just boggled my mind. And Matt was saying earlier, they can get it for like 170 whiskey crusaders. He said that they can get it for about 170 in Texas. Wow. Um, I'm pulling it up right now if I can find it. Yeah. 
He said, you can get to 25 here for 170. So great. That's really cheap. That is, yeah. But um, what, you have to, what you have to remember about Glen Farkless as well, you know, it has been owned by the same family for, for this you know, very long time. We're, we're not a white Mackay that's changed hands you know, 11 times in 50 years. You know, every time these distilleries get bought and resold, they have to reevaluate the, 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 what the stock's worth and you know, get the money back for it. Is that why the price of Glen Farkless has stayed pretty much the same, Matt, saying you know, the prices have stayed reasonable while some other distilleries have gotten out of control in terms of pricing for bottles? I mean, I, I think what's also, I mean, there's been several sort of reasons behind it. Yeah, I, I think there was like a big kick in the last sort of four or five years you know, with the rise of um, online auction sites, especially in the UK and Europe. And what happened with that was some distilleries realized, well, if the secondary market for whiskey is this high, why, why can't we get the, the similar sort of uh, money for it? So... Yeah, you know, the whiskey secondary market, it's a very expensive place, especially for, you know, sought after bottles. Scottish secondary market, the Scotch whiskey secondary market, I found because I, I pay attention to those and I don't sell, but I will buy, um, especially, you know, in bottle split groups so that I can taste something without having to buy a whole bottle if I don't need it or, you know, don't. I have never tried it before or something I want to try and won't be able to get a bottle. That's what I like about the bottle split groups. For scotch, the prices aren't usually out of control insane, whereas for some highly allocated bourbons or ryes, you know, just because it carries a certain brand name, uh, you know, it, it's four or $5,000 a bottle. And I'm like, it's not even that good. I, I have to tell you about my... Um... My, my story about buying a bottle of bourbon. So it's obviously Van Winkle brought out there, 25-year-old Van Winkle. I wasn't even talking about Van Winkle. I was talking about <laughs> Willet. I'm, I'm just going to use this as an example. So, so you know, I, I saw this come out and I was like, I really want to try that. I, I really, really like, want to see what, what a 25-year-old bourbon does sort of taste like. So, of course, you know, so I looked at the price. What was it, like $1,300 plus tax or something? Um, or fifteen hundred dollars plus tax, but you know that was the retail value. But but this was like bloody hen's teeth. You you, you basically having to enter a lottery to try and get a bottle. Luckily, I did know some people, um, so, so made a call, um, and I got my bottle for thirteen hundred dollars plus tax retail, um, and then it was hand delivered to me. And this is the bit that really annoyed me because because I'm crossing my head. You know, I was happy about the fact I would spent this money. If I opened the bottle and it tastes like crap, fine. <coughs> I, you know, I was happy to write that sort of value off. About 45 seconds after this bottle got into my hands, my phone rang. And it's an American guy on the phone. He goes, I hear you've got a bottle of Van Winkle 25-year-old. And I was like, Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, I do. You know, literally holding it, looking around. <laughs> How the hell does he do this? Uh, and, and he said, I'll give you $11,000 for it. And then went on a massive tirade, screaming and shouting down the phone of this guy for about four minutes about how he'd absolutely ruined this bottle of uh, bourbon for me. Because now all of a sudden, if I open a bottle and it's like crap, it's eleven thousand dollars that I've basically written off. Um, and I was, I was so upset. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but also eleven thousand dollars for a Van Winkle twenty-five. You know, but you know what is now? It's the same. You know, yeah, and I don't want to shit on the Buffalo Trace, or the Pappy, or, you know, the Sashrack portfolio, but just, you know, the whiskey is good. It's good if you can get it for what it costs. It's if good. you can get, you know, the Van Winkle tenure for like the 50 ish bucks that it costs, maybe even up to 75, it's tasty. And it's worth buying. Okay, but you so, if you so, so, have to pay I, 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 I secondary I pricing for it, I found then it's two bottles of it. One's <laughs> twenty thousand. One's twenty-one thousand. One's twenty-two thousand. <laughs> <laughs> George, everyone in the comments is wondering what the hell did you do with the bottle? Did you open it? Did you sell it? Did you drink it? Did you throw it away? Still got it. Still got it. <laughs> Still got yeah, it. And, 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 and then also. Uh, Josh had uh, very kindly sent me a sample of it to tr to, so I could drink it. <laughs> very, very kind. Very kind of him. <laughs> Joe Van Name is saying he's got several bottles of 20 years that he paid $70 for. Nice. That's a, that's amazing. We've never done a 20-year-old. Where did you find them? 
<laughs> no, I think he means Van Winkle, George. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I've got some of the old. Um, they used to do them for like a lot of um, like house pours and stuff. The Van Winkles. Uh, there was Slanted Door uh, did their own bottling. Several of them. Uh, there was the oh god, what was the Village Green? Is it the, Vill the Village Pub? Um, Where in New York or in uh, near San Francisco? In San Francisco. Uh, oh, I don't know. So, so I don't, you, yeah, you, uh, I don't know. know. Like 40, 50 bucks. Wow. Wow. How did the Scotch conversation turn on to Van Winkle? Bring it back. Bring it back, Sam. Bring it back, bring it back. So let's jump over to the 21 now. How does that sound to you, George and Katie? Perfect. I'm down. So while we taste through the 21, um, why don't you guys briefly just walk us through the 10, the 15, and the 17? Because as Katie mentioned, we have a stunted lineup today because you were taking your mom to drag brunch. <laughs> yep, that's why. Um, I, I'm i sorry, I, I know who, I just think that's hilarious that you took your mom out to Hamburger Mary's. For those of you guys watching and listening who aren't familiar with LA, Hamburger Mary's is in West Hollywood. And we is have well, Long Beach. You went to Long, Long Beach, there's one in yeah. Long Beach. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, so yeah. Hamburger Mary's is a chain restaurant, apparently. Even if, I don't know how many there are. There's a bunch. Um, yeah. And it's well known for having drag performers. They yeah. have drag bingo. They have, you know, and that's like the biggest claim to fame. Like the food, I'm sure, is okay. I've never been. Katie, you can attest to the food. Yeah, but their big claim to well. fame is that they have drag performances, and that's their draw. And it's a really cool thing. Yep. Yep. So that's what my mom wanted to do on Mother's Day. It's like Did a tradition. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how can you not? It's legitimately the most exciting. Like, the opening act was Spice Girls. Like, I couldn't be more happier, you know? So, so yeah. So, I, I couldn't I couldn't provide the full lineup. So, that's why. Because my mother was in town. <laughs> um. <laughs> hey, I appreciate you. I just couldn't resist giving you shit. It's all good. That's, it, was, it, was, it was her choice. Um, so, yeah. So, the tenure, as I was saying, I think... The tenure to me is, I mean, it's great for using in cocktails if you're going to make a nice Bobby Burns or if you're going to throw, um, actually, George, we just got this really cool cocktail in Las Vegas at a cigar bar, um, a space side Sour, which I had never had before. And now a space side Sour? That sounds amazing. Please give details. So they have the space side Sour, like they have it, with, I think it's with Glenn Levitt on the regular one, but there's an upcharge and you get a single malt space side Sour and it's with Glenn Farkless. Whoa. And... Glenn I was Levitt blown away. Malt. Oh no, it wasn't. It was not Glenn Levitt. It was um, what am I thinking? Chivas. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, it was definitely a blended because that was the upcharge. But um, I did a side by side, and oh my gosh, that the sherry whiskey in a whiskey sour was just the most gorgeous thing I'd ever tasted. So. I highly recommend it if you have the 10 or 12 year to, to throw that in a whiskey sour traditional one and, and try it out. But yeah. When you say traditional, do you mean up with an egg white or down over rocks? My tradition is up with an egg white. That's my tradition. I ordered a whiskey sour at a bar here the other day and they served it to me on the rocks. And I'm like, yeah, not a whiskey sour, but okay. <laughs> Technically it passes the test. <laughs> It does. So yeah, so the tenure, that's that's what the tenure. I mean, the tenure is beautiful. Um, obviously the youngest in the lineup, but has such an amazing flavor. I get a lot of hints of um like chocolate off of the tenure. Uh, I've I've once I've had it infused with cacao nibs and it was just so incredible. Like it just Ooh. yeah, it was a really that's what Blaine did over at a uh, oh my god, that place in the valley. Barrel and ashes. That place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over there. It was exceptional. So the tenure, yeah, definitely play with it in cocktails. Is that the price point? Why not? Go for it. And then um, getting into the 12 year to me is like a, a lot more sherry, a little bit more maybe cherry and vanilla undertones to it and less of that deeper chocolate. It just gets to be more of the sherry fruit forward brightness. So 12 year, like I said, also great in cocktails, but super standalone sherry forward whiskey. Um, I'm going to go have... to freaking get lemon juice. Or I'm not even, <laughs> I have lemons at home. I might juice it fresh. I'm lazy. I usually buy Paracone. 
and I'm going to put the 12 year in an egg white sour in the next couple of days, and I'm going to try it, and I'm going to hate you for it because it's going to be so fucking good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Matt is saying sherry whiskey in an old fashioned is the best. I, you have to try um, Glenfarclas, any of them actually, is in an espresso martini that works too. Wait, oh. what? Yeah. <laughs> Can mm-hmm. you give us the specs on that, George? Well, we, we, we actually ran through the whole William Grant range, then the whole J.G. Grant range, and uh, yeah, Glenn Farkle's 105, definitely won. Can you give us the specs on that? Like, are you subbing well, out the vodka or something yeah, for the Glenn yeah, Farkle's? Just, 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 just swap, the, swap the vodka for the whiskey. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so here's a question <laughs> I'm sure you get asked all the time since you brought it up. Are you related to the Grant family in the William Grant? I'll just say no. <laughs> you said honestly no? Yeah, I mean, you I'm cut sure out there for back, a second. I'm sure if you go back far enough, yeah, but you know, not. In the last <laughs> gotcha. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you for a second. You cut out for a sec. I thought you said, I'll just say no to like get over the question. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a couple people out here who have my name who were not related. I mean, where, where we are in, in the area, there's a lot of people called Grant. You know, it's a fairly we've got Castle Grant, we've got Grant Town and Spade. You know, it's a fairly common name. There's Glen Grant whiskey. That's very true. Grant's whiskey. There's also Grant's whiskey. There's Grant's and Glen Grant. There you go. They're, we're everywhere. Yeah, you know, I'm sure like I ask you all the time, it's like, oh, are you related to the people from William Grant? No. <laughs> But my normal, my normal reply is, you know, our surname is actually Grant. I don't believe most of theirs are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Look at George throwing shade today, Katie. It's all good. Um, um, all good. I'm loving the sulfuric notes in the 12 and the 21. It's not, um, it's not pronounced, but there is this bitter... There's these bitter tannic and sulfuric notes in the back end on the finish of the palette. Um, now these sherry casks you guys are using um, for the 21 year is that first fill as well, or is that all refills? No, no, no all, all the ranges are all exactly the same. So it's 60 percent first and second fill, 40 percent third and fourth fill. So, so, so okay. they, all, they, all, they all get married together. Um. So that brings up my next question of when you are getting these barrels from the bodega. Casks. I'm assuming they're, pardon? Casks. A, a barrel is a size and a shape. This is true. When you are getting these sherry casks from the bodega, I'm assuming they're coming to you wet. Uh, no, so what will actually happen with them, they'll be dumped in Spain. Um, that basically within eight days we will get them at the distillery. Uh, so they're literally just loaded onto a lorry and driven straight to us, and, and then we will fill them within two or three days as well. Okay, so they're not flat packed, they're sent wet, which then goes by the next question of is there sulfur candles inside of them? No, but it's um, historically they've come various different ways. Um, so you know, at one point they would actually have left some sherry in it to, to keep them more moist. But obviously, driving through Spain or wherever, um, a lot of the time the sherry was just turning to absolute vinegar and was just spoiling the casks. Uh, so, so they are you know, dumped to complete emptiness. So, do me a favor, since <laughs> you made a clear point of it. Barrel versus cask. Okay, so, so a, a barrel is a shape and a size. So, so for us, a barrel is um, obviously barrel-shaped. Um, so it holds 180 litres. Uh, we don't use hardly any of them. We primarily use uh, sherry butts, which are 500 litres, and sherry hogsheads, which are 250 litres. And then you've also got port pipes, which are 550. Um, you've got uh, octaves, firkins, quarter casks. There's lots of different sizes. So a barrel's a cask, but a cask is not a barrel? Well, a, a, a barrel, a barrel it's, it's, what, it's, one of the, it's one of the definitions of, of what falls under the under casks. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just that in the States, all you, all you use is barrels. So, you know, so, so you know, to, they're all the same size. So, so that's why you, you don't have the other def, other side of it. My head is spinning. 
<laughs> it's good. This was George taught me this three years ago, Sam. It gets ingrained in you, and then you just go. It's hard for it's hard for us Americans to speak their language, even though it's very similar. <laughs> I understand what he's saying. Yeah, I understand. The hogs had punchins, firkins, tons. Little husks. But my definition of a cask is the same as a barrel. It's a size. A hog's head is a type of barrel. Yeah. Little... Yeah. What do you mean, no? No. So just admit you're, just admit you're wrong. I can't. <laughs> so so, so a, a sherry butt for us costs us a thousand US dollars. Um, and, and we can basically get an ex bourbon cask if you want to buy them more than like 60 or 70 bucks. Okay, let's go to Miriam. Let's go to Cambridge Dictionary. Let's go to Cambridge.org. Oh, wow. <laughs> really digging into this. Barrel, noun, container. A large container made of wood, metal, or plastic with a flat top and bottom and curved sides that make it fatter in the middle. There you go. Now we're going to look up the definition of cask. Cask, a strong, round, wooden container used for storing liquid. Where's the difference, George? It's a cultural difference, I think. It's, more it's, than it's, any. It's, it's, it's then to give the actual definition. The, the, you can, it's easier to explain to people what, what you're actually talking about. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, George. I couldn't resist. <laughs> But then again, you've met me before, so you know how annoying I can be. I'll, I'll say yes to that as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, so we, we use cask when we speak about Glenn Farkless. Because, I don't know, I think of it more of, yeah, like, it, to me, it's like... It's Holy like hell, the whiskey dictionary's here. Oh, what is that? Who is that? My friend uh, Bill is... The he owns the Whiskey Dictionary channel, oh, well, that's and he's like one of the funny. biggest channels on YouTube, fifty k subs, and he's never come on to watch my stream before. <laughs> Hi, Bill. <laughs> Holy well, shit. Hi. Looking through the dictionary and had to come help you out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, cool. if you guys haven't checked out the Whiskey Dictionary, go drop him a sub and a follow. He's putting out cool content, and he does or was doing Tuesday trivia's, which I've gotten wrong more times than I care to admit. Um, he said, mm, Glenn Barkless. <laughs> yeah, Bill, there's a good one for you. Barrel versus cask trivia. <laughs> oh, not true. I'm usually just quiet, he says. Um, well, I'm glad you decided to say hello today. Cheers. Um, Mr. Whiskey Dictionary, since you are joining us and you are the Whiskey Dictionary, <laughs> what is the difference between a barrel and a cask? <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> well, he answers that and George gets mad at me. I'll, I'll, I'll just have another whiskey. Yeah, fine. Um, I'll, fix that. I'll fix that. One of the things I love about Glen Farkless is that because it is a sherry matured with, or not because it's, it is a sherry matured whiskey and its flavors are just, you know, really well balanced. It's not, you know, overly intense. It's not, you know, too sweet. It's not too, you know, vinegary or sherry E. It's got a nice balance where you can really taste the sherry, but you also really can dive into and taste the malt behind it, which is one thing that's really nice. And, you know, some sherry cask whiskeys are just a little too strong where you can't really taste the malt anymore. That's exactly. I mean, that, that, that's why we, having the the balance between the first fill, second fill, third fill, fourth fill. I mean, if you, if you can imagine drinking a, a first fill sherry cask whiskey, I mean, it's, it's like drinking whiskey with blinkers on. All you're getting is that sherry power, um, rich flavors coming through on it. But when you're using a second fill cask, third fill cask, you know, the blinkers are sort of coming away from the sides. You're getting more sort of dried fruit. You're getting more uh, vanilla flavors, a bit more of the oak, as you said, a bit more of the. Um, the maltiness, a bit more of the freshness coming through, which you don't always get on the first full sherries. Fair enough. And also, George, I, I hate to say it, but 
he sided with you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, it's two against one. Well, actually, three against one because Katie, you're on that team too. So. Yep. Yep. I'm on that team. Oh. I look. I look for other angles, but the definition to me makes sense. What is it in terms of tequila, Katie? Um. Well, if we use, we generally use uh, bourbon barrels. I guess I had never really thought about what cognac is considered. What cognac is? I guess they call them barrels in cognac as well. Yeah, cognac barrels, cognac. Yeah. I feel like they a lot of places, I guess, except for Scotland, use that much per, that term pretty interchangeably. But, but, but then also, even in Scotland, there's a lot of distilleries that will only use bourbon barrels as well. It, it, it's, it's, yeah. yeah. You know, Glendronic, Glenlivet, they use bourbon barrels pretty much for the... Pro <laughs> you might want to keep him quiet, Sam. I don't know. Leave it out for a second. Let me take a picture of that. Put it back. <laughs> Put it back, back up. up. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Reg. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll get to your question in a second, Bill. Uh, what I was saying, though, is that, you know, a lot of brands use bourbon as their primary maturation. Yep. And they do, you know, bye, Joe. Uh, they use then sherry or tequila barrels now that it's been legalized by the SWA or even, you know, other wine casks for a finishing. And I was actually getting into this last week with the boys from Tomatin. And it was a matter of if you're doing a maturation in two different casks, if you're doing one cask of, you know, bourbon for, let's say, five years, and then you do sherry for six years as your finish, is that a finish or is that just a secondary maturation? Or if you're doing 12 years in bourbon and then five years in sherry, is it a finish really or is it a secondary maturation? Because as long as it's past that three-year mark, it's technically a secondary maturation Be it's now past the legal age minimum in Scotland, right? So was that question? I think. <laughs> um, um, yeah, no, it's, the question was, you know, what is that considered in your opinion? Would that be, you know, a finish or would it be a secondary maturation? Well, you see, but my answer is really simple. Because we don't do it, I don't care. That's one Thanks, way to George. keep your life stress-free, George. I love that. Thanks, George. Um, <laughs> Bill said, since he just joined, question to both of you guys, is there anything Glenn Farkless is doing now that he should be excited about? Um, we've got a few different bottlings coming out. Obviously, only one of them is coming to the US. Uh, we've got 185th anniversary bottling coming out uh, a week on Thursday. Um, so, so that's when we turn 185 years old. And then later on this year, we've got a new 50-year-old coming out. So that's all there's something to be excited about. Now, which of those is coming stateside? The 50 year old. Okay. Very exciting. Very In terms of your, we don't do it, so I don't care. Matt is saying that's the best <laughs> answer ever. <laughs> you want to get a photo of that one too, George? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm good. <laughs> he knows he has the best answers. <laughs> oh, you know, George, I appreciate your special brand of answers and humor. Well, you know, you know, but you, but you're not having to work for a you know massive corporation and to tow the company line. It does make it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you kind of are the company line, it makes it easier too. Stay focused. He's staying focused. <laughs> All right, let's stay focused and move on to the 25. So again, 60-40, 60% first and second fill, 
And then 40% third and fourth fill, just eight to 25 years, yeah? Yep. But hopefully what you see when you are sort of running through the Glen Farkas line, I mean, they are all very distinct and very unique, but they still all have that underlying Glen Farkas flavor coming through on it. You know, and, but what's great about the 25-year-old, I mean, when I first started drinking whiskey 20 years ago, I really didn't enjoy the 25-year-old at all. I found it too too big, too heavy, almost like too bitter. Uh, but it's a whiskey that I really do enjoy an awful lot at the moment. Because obviously something really interesting happens to whiskey, um, which you do get to 25 years. You know, on paper anyway, we should have lost half the cask to evaporation. If we're losing 2% a year, uh, once you get to 25 years, we should be half liquid, half air. So, so you are getting a little bit more sort of uh, liquid to wood ratio, and you are picking up a bit more of those sort of tannins and wood flavors coming through in this particular whiskey. Ah. That's... Okay, I, I've, got, I've got a bite. What, what, what's the book? Oh, it's my book. I, I, got, well. I, got, a 50, I got a 56 minutes before I had to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Halfway. You, you know you made a mistake on it? You spelled whiskey wrong. Not again! <laughs> Oy vey. <laughs> <laughs> you get that every week. <laughs> I get that so often. <laughs> My favorite one star Amazon review came from Amazon UK. And it said, talking about tasty traditions, but doesn't even spell whiskey right. That's as far as I got. Whoa. He's like, talking about tasty traditions, but spells whiskey with an E. He didn't even read the book. He just looked at the title and is like, one star. And I'm like, thank you for the amazingly, amazingly, terribly amazing bad review. <laughs> that is the did best you, bad did, review I've ever gotten. <laughs> did yeah. you reply? No, I should have, though. I'm thinking about it still. Yeah, you This is to. dirty. Yeah. The tannin, like the tannin, the interaction with the wood is so pronounced. Oh, sorry, I, th I thought he was talking about you. Oh, me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. No, George. <laughs> it's 11 o'clock at night here. What do you expect? I know. Well, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon here, and I'm not going to be able to get any work done for the rest of the day. Yeah, I must say, the, the biggest mistake I, I did, I tried to do three tastings online in a day. Um, so, so I did one in Australia at 7 o'clock in the morning, I did one in the UK, but th then I tried to do one in the States, and I was like, yeah, I, this is not working out for me. <laughs> <laughs> I bet by the States one was fantastic. Oh, God. <laughs> fantastic. Very funny. No, but I the mean, this is already I great. George has only had, like, a glass. <laughs> at least on stream, anyway. <laughs> it's 11 o'clock at night. We thank I mean, you I, for joining us. I'm a little thank you for joining us, George. About the, about the whole COVID thing coming to an end. I mean, is it still going to be acceptable to be drinking at 11 o'clock in the morning? Well, was it ever not? Yeah, probably. Eh. Maybe, yeah. maybe a little, maybe the same acceptable. I don't know. People are really upset they can't take their cocktails to go anymore. That was a big issue out this weekend. Wait, yeah. really? Yeah, they were really sad. That's going away? Well, no, I think people like legitimately wanted to be Vegas, like dump their, like get a go cup and like go. <laughs> oh, no, fuck that. That's <laughs> never been okay in LA. Oh, well, I know, but down by the beaches, you know, we play a little, we play a little crazy. Yeah. I mean, I would kind of love for LA to have like New Orleans vibes where it's like, you know, you can just walk down like Holly Boulevard with a beer or a cocktail in your hand. I yeah. miss New Orleans. I miss New Orleans too, George. That's where we're going to go first. Let's all go. Okay, I hope you do another like one of those Sazerac pop-ups like you did that year. That was a fun one. Super fun. Well, we have the museum that's open now, so we have a home base to go meet up at for sure. Oh, yeah. I just think we can get a book into the museum. Yeah. Yeah. George, we'll get you a copy of this book, by the way, though. 
Um, that is my book. While you may consider I spelled whiskey wrong, um, I believe MLA format dictates that unless you're specifically speaking about scotch, or if you're drunk and white, unless you're specifically speaking about scotch or Japanese, you're supposed to use the E. Did you just make that up? No. <laughs> And let's go to the Scotch page. <laughs> this book is getting so much use, like on camera. It's like all, like, freaked out. Well, you put it right there. Yeah, as a prop originally. <laughs> and George, right here on page fifty-four. Oh. Lampar plus twelve. Awesome. It's there. It's in print. It's a very fun book. Because I love me some Glenn Parkless. Don't we all? I'm still trying to dissect this 25. There's molasses and... It's almost like, like a coffee liqueur syrup sort of... Honey flavors. butter? Um, hmm. The coffee liqueur, so you put this one in the espresso martini. I'll try the bowl. <laughs> but the 105. The 105 one. Yeah, yeah I used to, when it's I first literally... started. Literally. Sorry, Katie, please go ahead. No, I, to George's point earlier, when I first started drinking um, drinking the Glen Farkless line, I was not a huge fan of the 21 and 25 year old just because to me they were more of these really bigger, bolder flavors that. I wasn't, my palate just wasn't ready for. Um, and now, yeah, yeah but, now. But thing, yeah, as, as we do all get older, you, our palates do change. You do appreciate different flavors and different um, things. So. Yeah, there's literally something for everyone in this line, even though it's exactly the same product, just aged. It, I mean, every age, um, it brings out a different flavor profile and a different attraction. And it's there's something for absolutely everyone in this lineup, which That's is it. so cool. Completely agree. Yeah. No, that's the one of the benefits of something like Glen Farkless that is so approachable. You know, one of the reasons I love Glen Farkless is that while you do have a fantastic range of Scotch whiskey without the E, George. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's approachable for a newer drinker as well as you know someone like yourself or Katie or myself or any of the people watching. Oftentimes, you know. Anand, who I think you saw mention he got the 40-year. He found a 40-year finally earlier. He first tried it back in the distillery, you know, five or six years ago. Let me see if I can pull that comment up real quick. Um, there we go. Cool. We do sell the 40 in the U.S. too? Lots of it? Yeah, he finally found it is what he was saying. Yeah. Um, the story about when that first came out? Please. When I, first launched, when I first launched the forty-year-old, it, it was in a, uh, it was supposed to be a ruby tube, but it turned out a little bit sort of pink. Um, but when it first came out, it retailed in the UK for three hundred pounds, or retailed in the US for five hundred dollars, and, and that, that was the, the price point that I wanted to set at. And everyone always said, "Well, why do you want to set at this?" And my answer was really, really simple. So at the time, the most amount of cash I could take out an ATM was three hundred pounds, or in the US it was five hundred dollars. <laughs> so ergo, the most amount of money I could spend without my wife knowing what I spent the money on was three hundred pounds or five hundred dollars. Because after that, it's going to go to your credit card, and you know what happens to your credit card receipts. <laughs> you are incorrigible, George. Incorrigible. Uh, sorry. <laughs> but no, the beauty, the beauty and benefit of Glen Farkless is that. You know, there's something in it, a little bit of something in it for everyone, be they a more modern, more, not modern, more novice beginning drinker or a more advanced drinker. You know, that's the beauty I like of Glenn Barclays is that it is really approachable and it captures my attention. There's a lot of drinks, a lot of whiskey that, you know, I used to really enjoy and now I don't really touch anymore because I've moved past it and no longer intrigues and incites me. But I mean, that, that's what we've always tried to do with, with all the different um, skews from Glen Farkless it is the fact that, you know, you remember drinking 21-year-old Glen Farkless you know, 10 years ago. If you go back and try it again, it's going to be the same whiskey you remember. 
you know, that, that's what's always been really important for us to, to maintain that consistency to, to let people and, and know that you know, when they do come back to try it whether whether it be next month next year or in five years it is going to be the flavors that, that they remember i love it i respect that and i appreciate that greatly you know how often are you in the distillery in the blending room you know actually working with the actual liquid uh, we don't really have a blending room to per se uh, but <laughs> So for the standard range of Glen Farkless, uh, which is obviously 8, 10, 12, 15, 17, 21, 25, I guess 30 now too, um, it, it's, it's something that I did, did used to get much more involved in. Um, I, I now sort of get much more into the special items, so like 40 plus, uh, so like the 185, um, obviously the, the family cast selection. It's We, we do have like a sort of a, a team at the distillery that, that does uh, you taste things as, as we go along. But again, you, it, it's... I'm going to say this really badly, but it's um, it's not rocket science. You know, again, when you have done it for such a long period of time, we know, um, you know, how many sherry butts or how many sherry hoggies from which warehouse uh, that we're going to put together that we're going to get the the whiskey that we want. Yeah, fair enough. You know, for those of us who haven't been doing it for a long time, though, it does seem a little bit like rocket science. Um, and you know it. It's definitely something, I wouldn't say it's magic and mystery, but it's something that intrigues a lot of us, you know, whiskey enthusiasts, whiskey nerds. If you want to, you know, know how you do it, you know, why did you settle on 25 year, 12, 21 year, 12 year? Why did you make an eight years, tw a 10 year, a 17 year, a 15 year? You know, how did you get to 43% ABV? And, you know, I think we're all, that's some of the stuff we're all kind of curious about. Okay, so the, the, the age specifications, I, I guess, um, at, at the time, initially, obviously, everyone was doing like a three-year-old, five-year-old, eight-year-old, but the, then as whiskey became sort of a little bit more mainstream, to 10-year-old at 40% became the UK sort of standard. Um, why 10 years old? I, I couldn't actually tell you that, but 40% uh, was the, the lowest uh, whiskey can be and still be called whiskey. So therefore, it was the lowest amount of tax that people were paying on a bottle. So that's why it was at 40%. 40 why is it generally at 43 in the US? Uh, your system was, you could not sell, again, this is going back a long way, you could not sell a distilled spirit in the US unless it was 43% or above. Huh. Um, but then, so when people started to sell to the US market, um, we didn't want to have a 10 year old at 40% for like, the European market and then a 10 year old at 43% for the US. So that's why 12 year old really became um, a whiskey's standard in the US. So the 12 year old became the industry standard uh, in your market. And that's why you know, everything sort of starts at 12 and goes upwards. Um, and that, that's why what, why 43 became that, that sort of norm as well. And, you know, speaking of proof, uh, and this one still boggles my mind a little bit. Would you go into, as we go into the 105, you know, as well, in fact, you know what, I'm going to take a pour of this, one of the five, I'm taking a pour of the 105 as soon as I ask you this question. Would you or Katie, you know, go into a little bit about imperial proof? Because the 105 is not 105 proof. And a lot of people I know see it. It's, a, it's, it's not 105, 105 proof. It's American American proof. Or, or it's 120 of your made-up American proof. <laughs> George tells this story better than I do, so I think that he should take it. He's like a little cop kid in the candy, really giddy with George. He's like, I get to talk about imperial proof and talk about the Americans again. Yeah. I mean, so, so our proofing system actually has a story behind it. I mean, if you came and saw me 300 years ago and said, I want to buy some of your whiskey, we weren't maturing any of our whiskey then, so I would hand you clear liquid. You would then say to me, "Well, prove to me that it's whiskey." So I would take a sample of it, mix it with gunpowder, and light it. If it exploded, I'd prove that I made whiskey. Whiskey explodes at 100 British proof or 57.9% alcohol. So the word "prove" prove evolved into the word "proof." Your proofing system, Jesus, where was that invented? <laughs> Pardon? It uses the what? Our proofing what? system is. Um, Made up. It just proves. What does it prove, it George? That's a, so, so I mean, if you if you, can, if you bought, find an old bottle of one hundred five, it will say five OP on it, five over proof. If you, if you find a bottle of old bottle of ten year old, it will say seventy proof. So seventy proof equates to forty percent alcohol. But that now this is where it's my shortcoming because I I'm not good at math. 
Um, can you explain? And Matt wants to know too. He's like, you know, can you go into the math behind it of why Imperial proof is it's 105 in Imperial proof, but it's 120 in uh, you know freedom proof, as I like to call it. <laughs> Freedom units. But, 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 but you can't equate to logic and something that's made up. You, you can't compare the two. You know, the, the, it's um, it's the same thing as um, you know, Americans like everything that's bigger. So, so you just took the alcohol strength and you doubled it. Brilliant. Okay, it's, but it's, it's, George, it's you're not you have, George. It's the same as because you have Fahrenheit, we have Celsius. You just want bigger numbers. Okay, George, uh, let's, I, I get that. that. <laughs> I understand that Americans are just going and doubling what we see on the bottle, mm -hmm. but I want you to explain to me the math behind imperial proof. It's um, I, I don't know the, the math behind it. I mean, there are obviously going to be a simple sort of formula to work out, but um, we we literally had the proofing system before we before we had alcohol by volume, um, and it was simply you, you, it, we found by dropping the hydrometers and stuff into the whiskey. Um, it, it's the same as. I can't fathom out old money, you know, uh, shillings, pence, and everything that we used to have in the UK. Um, I don't have a bloody clue about that. All right. So alcohol proof is a measure of the content of ethanol, alcohol, and alcoholic beverage. The term was originally used in England and was equal to about to about 1.821 times the percentage alcohol by volume. So if we're wow. going to get 105 proof, let's divide by 1.821. That would be 57.66% ABV to get to 105 proof. 1.821. This is technically 109 proof by your standards. <laughs> technically. Did you find right. that on Wikipedia? I wouldn't believe anything on that. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. Oh my God! You're making it so hard for me, George. You're making it so easy for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's I find usually, somewhere. So, Sam, I usually describe it as this: is okay. So, back when we were saying this is a hundred proof, nobody was measuring the alcohol by volume content of what they were saying was a hundred proof, and then anything that was like hotter than that would be OP overproof, and they would add five to it. So you would have 105 proof because once we went back in his and science came into play, we found out that what was called 100 proof was actually 57 percent ABV. So adding that three percent alcohol is technically over the proof. So you add the five. So you get to 105. What? Yeah, it makes. <laughs> so, so smoking. No, it doesn't. Legal, isn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. What did you say, George? Smoking weed in California is legal. <laughs> yes, oh, right. and your isn't point what, being? But isn't that what you're saying, right? So they used to say this is 100 proof and no science was not involved. And if it was over or under, it? yeah. yeah it, was, it, was a, it was a simple way of working out. Yeah. And then and then we started measuring it. And so it was. Passenger difference in the composition of the gunpowder used to provide flammable proof that it was he was of adequate strength for sale. Right. Yeah. You know, going That's back right. to the English sailors, they used to get a tot of rum yes, as part of their they, pay. They, they and to prove that the officers hadn't diluted it, they mixed it with gunpowder. And if it lit, it was proven, therefore proof. And it burned blue, it was over proof. But, but, but also, you had to make, because the, uh, the rum casks were stored next to the gunpowder casks, the, um, if the rum leaked, also, you, it, still, yeah, you could still light the gunpowder. Yep, exactly. Very true. That's the other aspect of it I always forget to mention. Thank you, George. You're very welcome, sir. Well, you know, I, I'm here to correct you as much as possible. <laughs> I'd like to thank you for coming along to watch the George show. It's um, very kind <laughs> to have my guests here. I love it. We love the George show. <laughs> so what do you think about God the one damn it, Vlad. <laughs> uh, my friend Vlad said this conversation is proofing to be hilarious. <laughs> um, no, you know I love the 105. It's always been my favorite of the line. 
because I'm a glutton for cask strength. You know, I can't get enough of the cask strength. I'm a bit of a glutton for punishment. And, you know, just, do, just drinking pure cask strength, just, there's nothing like it. So I'm going to say to you one thing. So the Far Plus 105 is now almost 50% of my sales. Through, through the whole line of my farmers, almost 50% is just 105. Why is that? Because it's the best. Nope. Next. Oh, because of the label. It's easy to read. The 105, I'll have the 105. You, you, you're close. You're actually really close. Because I mean, you've got to think, you know, people in the UK, people in the US, you know, people do struggle to, to say, pronounce the word Glenfarclas. And if you think you go abroad, people are looking at that and going, I've got no idea how to say that at all. Uh, but thankfully, 105, a number, translates into any language in the world. We just got really lucky. It wasn't You're strategic. Right. Katie, he told me this before. <laughs> yeah. But that wasn't strategic. You just got lucky, you think? Yeah, I just got lucky. I mean, we, we, we've, done one, we've done 105 since 1968. It, it's been around a long time. Yeah. Was it was it the first cast strength to come to the market? It was certainly the first cast strength whiskey that was consistently available. So 1968 when it came out, um, if you find the Guinness Book of World Records from the early 1970s, you'll find 105 there. Um, as far as regular cast strength whiskeys, I mean, you've also got a Buddha McAllen used to do a cast strength whiskey as well, but, but their strengths would always change as well. You know, it, it, it's something yeah, like it was the, McAllen classic cut, right? That was right. Or was it the original cask strength? The, the one that was the one that was uh, a red sort of reddish label that had it. Huh. Cask strength, yeah, now it's called cast yeah. cut. Um, Matt says he needs a chalkboard for all this math. <laughs> Anan says doesn't really matter. The end result is tasty. Yes. <laughs> Vlad <laughs> saying, uh, Glenn Farkless comedy hour right here. And then again, Matt is saying George also moonlights as a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> and then Anand also brought up a very good point of Glenn Farkle is hard to pronounce. Try outrunning an Aberlauer Abuna. Okay, no, no offense. How do you pronounce your name? Anand. Anand? Anand. Anand. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, a lot, there's lots of stuff that you just see. You know, people just get used to or, or say differently. And, and, and in Australia, I, I used to live in Australia. The people I used to work with could not say Glen Farkless to save their lives. They used to pronounce it Glen Fark you. <laughs> I don't know. Thank you. Try telling you. Yeah, but I don't listen to you. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Oh. No, Glenn Farkless is hard even for some of my uh, my near and dear friends to say. So we yeah, but they're all alcoholics. So when you get really drunk, it's difficult to say a lot of things. <laughs> yep, this is true. It's true. You feel responsible for drinking on the channel, George. <laughs> we just we just slur Glenn for uh, and hope they pour us something good. <laughs> that's it. Glenn, I'm, I'm, I'm. <laughs> okay, it's so a funny story. Um. <laughs> The industry night that you hosted at Trash of Rass all those years ago, it was, you had the neat pour option of a Demi or a Glen Farkless. So I went to the bar, I'm like, hey, you know, can I have a Glen Farkless? And I hadn't had it at that point in time. Or, no, I definitely, I take it back, I had had it, but when they, what they poured me was clearly not a Glen Farkless. They poured me a Demi for some reason. Uh -oh, I don't know right. why. Those are very but different flavors. Glass. Very different. I'm like, this is not taste like whiskey. This cannot be whiskey. He couldn't understand you. I mean, I was sober. I had just woken up from a nap and then came over there. So I just got enough work. No, no, no. I, I beg to differ. You know, I, I don't believe that that day has ever happened before. <laughs> George, with all the respect, shut the hell up. <laughs> Oh, you guys. Well, cheers. It's all good fun and good banter. I know. You guys are the best. 
So, George, talk to us about the 40 and the 50. So the 40 is, did we not cover that already? Here we go to that. Yeah, we did uh, a little bit. We don't get a lot. We did a we little bit, but I want to dive a little bit deeper into it. But we still have 45 minutes. Unless you want to leave. I'm leaving. You said an hour. I asked you what you wanted to do. You didn't respond. Yeah, you know, I only just, so one of the issues I had when I was trying to log in, I had all these different messages from you. And I was like, could not find the original uh, login details. Um, for a 40 year old is, when it first came out, Okay, the original 40-year-old was actually done for the millennium, and, and there was only over 590 bottles, and it took 12 years to sell 590 bottles. We now, with the, the new 40 that came out in, in the, the Ruby Tube, that I said, was originally at 46%. And it, it did quite well, uh, but, but the new one that's in the big red box, which is at 43%, um, literally, we, we, we bottle it once a year, um, however many thousands of bottles we managed to do, and it sells out in minutes. Gotcha. The new 50 year old that's coming out. Um, there's actually going to be another one coming out next year as well, but we'll, I'll leave that one just now. Uh, but yeah, the 50 year old, we, again, we're just fortunate that we do have some older sort of stock. Um, and I want to do a new 50. It's, it's been a long time since we've done a distillery 50 year old release. Well, George, thank you. We appreciate your time. And we will let you go. We we're not sure what we were doing. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to call it here for the night. Thank you so much for watching. I will be live again next Tuesday and doing tequila actually on this channel next week. Wow. Well, what, time is, what time is that? Can I, can I come and heckle you on that one too? No, you are not welcome back on this channel, George Grant. <gasps> so okay, maybe, absolute... maybe, but not next week. It's next week isn't your show. Fast. It's not even as out of my portfolio. <laughs> next week is Severo and Shinako. Fun time. Um, Matt says done. he really wants a 40 for his 40th this year. Hopefully he'll get lucky and get one. I, I have one question to ask before I go. So, so when you do your tequila tasting next week, do you have the whiskey book out in front of you at the same time? I will, yes. Ah, awesome. This is a permanent set part of my display. This is part of my set, George. Perfect. George, thank you for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you next week. 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Severo and Shinaqua Tequila is part of the Hodling Co. portfolio. I tried them recently, and they're actually good enough to actually went out and bought a bottle, even though it is diffuser and autoclave, and I really enjoyed it despite that. So cheers. We'll see you next Thank time. Thank you, much. Katie, love you. Bye. Bye, George. See you soon. Peace cheers. Bye. Bye.